Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a U.S.-supported coup in Pakistan. Our guest, Abdul Jabbar, is an emeritus professor at City College of San Francisco and a visiting professor of English at University of California, Berkeley. He came to the U.S. on a Fulbright scholarship and has received two National Endowment for the Humanities awards. His books are Reading and Writing with Multicultural Literature in Search of Reconciliation Reconciliation and Peace, and Not of an Age, But for All Time, Revolutionary Humanism in Iqbal, Manto, and Faiz, and The Promise, Reality, and Potential of America's Cultural Diversity. Abdul Jabbar, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, and thank you for the introduction. I'm very uh, happy to be on your show. I'm very glad you're here, although it's not happy news i think what's been happening in in pakistan what what has been done to the former president imran khan this has been long in the making you know there since biden became president he chose not to engage with imran khan at all so in fact there was a joke uh, people teased imran khan how come biden hasn't contacted you that Biden called everyone in the world, Tom, Dick, and Harry, uh, not you. He said that he's probably too busy. And the problem was actually that Imran Khan, uh, the US uh, gripe, Biden gripe, was that Imran Khan and his Pakistan government had not done enough to help the US in Afghanistan. And Imran Khan's position was that we are friends with everyone in peace, but we will not take part in anyone's war any longer. And he cited the um, statistics, which are frightening, which most Americans don't know, that it, the war on terror cost Pakistan 80,000 lives. That includes 35,000 soldiers. And the rest were victims of terrorism. The terrorism was done by the people of Pakistan against the government for siding with the US in creating this tension in the neighboring countries. So it is uh, really uh, going back in times when Trump was president, he criticized Imran Khan that he, Pakistan had not done enough Imran Khan replied, he gave the statistics, $1 billion worth of losses, 80,000 lives. And he said, how can you say that, Mr. Trump? Then Trump became very friendly with him. And I don't know if you may recall that Trump invited Imran Khan to the White House. And uh, they had a great meeting in which uh, Trump offered to mediate between Pakistan and India in exchange for Pakistan to help extricate America from Afghanistan. I'm using Trump's word, extricate. Now, yeah. that was very cordial, but when Biden took over, um, Biden's attitude was totally different. He never engaged. So it started with that. And then uh, Imran Khan refused to give military bases uh, in Pakistan. That was another factor that soured the relationships between the two countries. And this goes back, does it not, at least to President Obama's time and the U.S. claim to the right to blow anybody up that it wanted to with missiles from drones in Pakistan and Imran Khan objecting and uh, and to the uh, the Osama bin Laden killing with the fake vaccination effort set up and so forth. Not a lot of respect for Pakistan from the US government. Perfectly right, David. I think that does go back to the time of Obama, President Obama. And that really, uh, the policy of drones is what made the terrorism happen against the government of Pakistan, but the terrorists didn't really have access to the army. 
the army is fortified, the people who make decisions in the army, that they, they are not hurt, but the rank and file are hurt. And I, I guess at one time you may know that uh, about 400, I'm not sure about over 100 students in a military academy were all killed by terrorists to punish the military uh, for attacking their own people. But the drone attacks were killing innocent people. And anyone who lost a family member became enemy of the government, not the people of the US. I think people understand all over the world that there is a hiatus between the government's policies and the people of the United States. They're very friendly, warm toward the people, but they hate the politics, the US politics. And you're right, it goes back in time. I suppose that the last uh, uh, straw I would mention is uh, the visit to Russia by Imran Khan on the eve of uh, uh, the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And now Imran Khan had no way of knowing, <laughs> like um, Putin didn't text uh, Imran, hey, I'm going to attack Ukraine. Imran had no way of knowing it would happen, but he was concerned because things were happening, brewing, and he talked to the Security Council within Pakistan, which in involved the then general army at Bajwa and other high officers, military and civil. And they all said that he should go because the mission was to get cheaper oil and cheaper wheat for the suffering population of Pakistan. 30% reduction in wheat price, 30% in oil. So, and General Bajwa himself said to him, yes, that he should go. Unfortunately, this was all a setup by General Bajwa. He was the army chief then. He even had a lobbyist in Washington by the name Hussein Haqqani. He had been a former ambassador to the US so who was lobbying against Imran Khan, that Imran Khan is anti-US. Now, Imran, whenever he had a chance, he clarified it. In fact, uh, just a few days before uh, this meeting between Donald Liu and the Pakistani ambassador, Majid Amjad, he said, that is Imran Khan's words. I think we should really, uh, I would quote these words. They're very important. He said, we are friends of Russia and we are friends also of the United States. We are friends of China and Europe. We are not part of any alliance. Now this could be as clear as possible. And the reason Imran Khan wanted Pakistan's government to abstain from the vote on Ukraine at the UN was at that time, the deal with Russia was going on about cheaper oil, cheaper wheat. And Imran actually wanted to play a role of mediation between the two countries. He has been looked up to by the entire world as a very honest, peace-loving person who promotes diplomacy and solution through diplomacy. That's what his agenda was. Unfortunately, everything got turned around against him in that meeting with Donald Liu and the Pakistani ambassador, which is very, we all know that from the contents of The Intercept. Now, David, my own reaction is to all, this is nothing new to me. I am not surprised. I'm not excited about the Professor case. Jabbar, for, for listeners who are not familiar, what did the Intercept report and what was confirmed by that? I think that's, uh, thank you for that question. The Intercept reported on a secret communication between the 
Pakistani ambassador to the US. And the conversation that the ambassador had with Donald Liu. Now, Donald Liu is an assistant secretary of state, uh, Bureau of South Asian and Central Asian Affairs. That meeting took place on March 7th. In that meeting, Donald Liu told the ambassador that the US government was very displeased with neutrality of Pakistan over the Ukraine attack. And there will be consequences if Khan is not removed from power in the no confidence motion. Now, Donald Liu even knew about the no confidence motion. So, and he said, the ambassador said, uh, well, on these complex matters, people should not, countries should not be forced to take sides. There should be a, there should be room for neutrality and working toward peace negotiations and bilateral communication. And uh, the ambassador was very clear, hoping that it will not create a dent in the relationship between the US and Pakistan. Now, Donald Lowe's response was extremely arrogant. Uh, he was very dismissive. He told the ambassador, well, you have stated your point of view. I will communicate it to my government. And Donald Lowe was again saying, the dent has already been created. Answering the ambassador, he said, you're talking about the dent. The dent is already created. Let us see in the next few days how things play out, if things change in Pakistan, if Khan is removed from power, Pakistan will be forgiven, forgiven. And if he stays in power, he will be isolated by European Union and surely by the US. And so that was the gist of the meeting. It was a long meeting, but I just gave you a few major points from the meeting. And now he is not only removed from power, but sentenced to prison. Not only that, uh, David, he was the target of an assassination attempt last year. He yeah. almost died. There, was a, uh, there were several uh, shooters, trained shooters, and he was injured. He survived. His legs are still uh, not fully recovered. And uh, that was one attempt. And then another attempt was made on him when he was kidnapped from the judicial compound. And when uh, the rangers, which are a part of the army, they smashed the windshields of, the, of his car and arrested him and you know, just put him in custody. The latest was in, on August uh, 5th, I believe, 3rd or 5th, I'm not sure, when he was arrested on a charge that is ridiculous and it will be thrown out of, the co out of the court within five minutes. Now the problem is the judge who made the decision, his name is Dilawar, he left the country after making the decision and he is in London. Ironically, he, the university hall, H-U-L-L, -L, is giving a uh, program on human rights and he's supposed to be participating in, the, in that. There has been a, a thousands of uh, letters of protest to the university, so he may not be allowed to take part. Anyway, this is going a little bit uh, more into the background of what is happening as a consequence. My own reaction to all this is something is hopeful to me. The only thing hopeful, not the election, the election, if it happens, will be rigged by the army and they will install whoever they want, not Imran Khan. He's, he has been sentenced to three years in prison and 
disqualified to run, his party will still win if election takes place. But if election take place, his party will not win because of the rigging, uh, which always happened in the past. Now, to me, the hopeful thing is not election. The only hopeful thing is who leaked this secret document to the intercept. When such leaks happen, my first concern is who could have done it? It is very risky. The person runs the risk. After all, you know, inter services intelligence, ISI of Pakistan can find out anything anywhere in the world according to the uh, claim that they make. Now, this person who leaked the information, gave the copy of the document to the intercept, is associated with the military of Pakistan. So now, obviously, within the rank and files of the military, there is a movement to stop going further down in the hole for the whole country. There was a protest by the retired generals, not just uh, ordinary rank and file. And they asked the former chief, what happened to your promise to us about democracy and elections? And why is it all happening? And you know what happened to them? They were threatened that they would not receive any pension if they again took part in any of the demonstrations against the against the military and supporting of Imran Khan. And right now, even the image of Imran Khan is forbidden to be shown on TV. His name cannot be mentioned. So I cannot be hopeful about this at all. But the source, the only hope is from within the army, some officers could rise and tell the current chief, listen, this is not the way to go. The economic crisis is driving the country too far into a crisis. So you know, that's just a little background. And if I am not mistaken, uh, in the cases of Daniel Hale and Reality Winner, if not others, uh, people who have taken a risk leaking information to the intercept have been exposed. Uh, so this is a real risk. And one hopes that the intercept has improved its practices of, of handling uh, sources carefully so that they are not exposed. But someone ha has been has been courageous. Uh, and that that is encouraging. I hope that they do take all precaution precaution that the source is not caught and you know punished. The punishment will be just too severe. It will not be something just a few years in jail. I've I've heard from someone in Pakistan complaining to me that people on the left, people who know better, people who should have stood up and and supported Imran Khan have actually been jealous of him and of of his widespread support and have sat back and not taken action uh, to defend him against this this sort of effort. Uh, and certainly around the world and in the United States, which bears responsibility, you don't see people rising up in large numbers to to support Imran Khan. Um, what what has gone on here? The support for Imran Khan in Pakistan in the masses is 80%. The left um, tried to propagate some false things against Imran, especially uh, his statement uh, about women's being raped. And uh, he said that uh, the West is different from Pakistan's culture and the women should do everything in the West. It is okay to wear what you want to wear and you are safe in Pakistan's culture women should protect themselves more. So that was twisted and the left tried to say that he is um, defending the rapist in a way. <laughs> so the left has played a very negative role in um, supporting the person they should have supported, somebody they had been wanting to appear on the political scene. 
um, I don't remember in the history of 76 years of Pakistan, after the founder of Pakistan, Qadi Azam Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, this is the first leader about whom uh, I can say he's 100% honest. He has never asked his party members to protest violently in his huge rallies, not even a flower pot was broken. So a person who is honest, the Supreme Court called him, Supreme Court gave him the title of honest and trustworthy. You know, yeah. so, uh, but I, I'm very disappointed at the West um, in, in, I think people here in the West don't know much. They don't have the information, but if they had the information, like now they have through your program and through uh, maybe some media coverage now with the help of the Intercept League, things will change. People here are wonderful once they know the information. The problem is the information is not given to them. If it is given, it is twisted and it is not the right information. Now, for example, if you go by the spokesperson of the White House, Matthew Miller, if you only listen to him, you don't read the Intercept report, you will come away with the opposite of what I'm saying. Right. Because Matthew Miller lied blatantly the document is there, and he was asked, uh, and he made a joke of it. He was asked about the role of the U.S. in the ouster of Imran Khan. He said, well, I am going to probably put a sign and say, I have been repeating it so many times, and say, we had no role. Now, he, does he think the people are uh, stupid? Now, Intercept has the words, of Don and Lou, that if Imran Khan is not removed from power, there'll be consequences of Pakistan. Is that not taking sides? So Milan says, we have never taken sides, we have never intervened, and this is all false. It has been false, it will be false. Now that is Matthew Miller. If our viewers listen to only him, they will not know the truth, unfortunately. And most of us do that. We go uh, with, like a, it's a quick way to get information. Yes. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll recall that nine years ago, we had US State Department officials recorded and made public discussing a coup in Ukraine prior to the coup. And you couldn't have more uh, powerful evidence. Uh, and yet, the general understanding is that there was no coup, not that the US had nothing to do with it, but it never happened. Uh, and, and so I think there's, there's a problem uh, that the US public is unaware of, but that the world must be taking seriously when the offense wasn't supporting the Russian side in the war, the support was being honest and neutral, and that was unacceptable to be honest and neutral. This, you know, and neutral countries in Europe now have to join NATO there. They cannot be neutral. This ought to be a concern to quite a number of countries around the world, I would think. Hi, uh, David, that's a very important point you have raised uh, about uh, the truth versus the propaganda about neutrality. And just uh, one example would be very enlightening for all of us that India and Sri Lanka also were neutral. They abstained from voting. And India's Prime Minister Modi was given a royal welcome just recently. And he is somebody who was declared persona non grata. He could not have entered the US after his massacre of thousands of Muslims when he was the, um, I think he was the governor of uh, Gujarat. A chief minister or governor, I don't know the exact designation. But at one time, now he was, he also voted. So I'm talking about our double standard. Yeah. Is, he buys a lot of weapons. Oh, yes. He buys a lot of US weapons. And the market, it is just a market that drives our foreign policy, not 
humanitarian considerations, unfortunately. No, it's uh, we we have just a, a few minutes left, uh, Professor Abdul Jabbar. We we have in the U.S. now this very strange phenomenon of someone being prosecuted for an attempted coup, uh, namely Donald Trump, because it was the the one and only U.S. coup that was in the U.S. Can this can this standard ever be applied to any of the U.S. facilitated and trained and armed and supported coups in the rest of the world? Oh gosh, no, never. I I can just think of examples close to home, uh, near Pakistan, in Iran, nineteen fifty three, the democratically elected leader Musaddaq, Doctor Musaddaq was overthrown and the coup was engineered by our CIA. Yes. What happened to them, the people who arranged the coup? Well, they were rewarded here with better jobs. Nothing, and you're right, nothing happened. You know, this doctrine of uh, um, not neutrality at all, uh, no acceptance of that, goes back to Bush doctrine. You are either with us, or with the enemy, if you remember. I'm talking about uh, yes. Bush, uh, the notoriety of uh, one million innocent Iraqis killed during his watch. I'm talking about you're either with us or with the enemy. No, that is not a very sensible stand. Neutrality is extremely helpful. Pakistan arranged the end of the date, uh, the detente and arranged rapprochement between the US and China. In 1970, Pakistan facilitated Kissinger going to China. Now, that started the relationship between China and the US. If Pakistan had not been um, in the good books of China, China would not accept Pakistan. If, China, if Pakistan had said, no, we condemn China, we condemn Russia, because we are friends with the US. Unfortunately, you know, uh, concluding comment I make, David, first of all, thank you for giving enough time for a conversation to at least evolve in a direction where audience is not confused. <laughs> Such matters can be very confusing. Yes. So I, I'm just uh, thankful to you for, for that. I appreciate your knowledge also, your questions. And that is a rarity in our media these days. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you coming on the program and everything you've been writing and, and saying. We've been speaking with Professor Abdul Jabbar, who is a professor emeritus at City College of San Francisco and a visiting professor of English at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Abdul Jabbar, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for having me. It was my pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.